and we'll do verses 12 through 15. As I was preparing for this, and I was doing a couple details last night, went to sleep, had a dream, in the dream, the, the very sp spirit that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight confronted me. The enemy will always try to get in the way and intimidate the people of God from doing what, uh, what God wants them to do. He's going to try to get in our way when we, we speak things that are from the word. In James chapter 1, verses 12 through 5, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he, tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bring forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. You can be seated. Obviously, we know there's a lot of words in the Bible. Many, many, many words. Lots of meanings, uh, lots of ideas, lots of phrases, lots of applications from the Word of God. Uh, some words, as we read, are commonly thought of in as somewhat of a narrow way. When we read a certain word, we automatically think, oh, this is what it means, sometimes without applying context. There's other words in the Bible that we can read and we think of in a br very broad term, and it applies to everything we possibly do in life. I, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that temptation is one of those words. Sometimes how we receive or think about this word is limited. When we read it, some common ideas that the church comes up with very quickly come to our mind. When we read temptation, we think sexual sin, we think lying, and we think stealing, typically. Sometimes some other things like killing, stuff like that. But those are common ideas that come to our mind when we read this word temptation. Maybe someone was tempted to look upon someone lustfully or look at something on the internet they shouldn't. Maybe there's a temptation to take someone up on an inappropriate offer made at work. Or maybe it won't harm anyone if I'm dishonest. Why I was late to work, for example. Or why I'm having a hard time. Or maybe it won't harm my spouse or my family, my friend or my pastor if I'm not honest about how I'm really feeling, how I'm really doing, what, what's really going on in my life. Those are some thoughts that can occur when we are thinking about the word temptation. But today we're going to utilize this word in, in, in more so of a broad term and a broad meaning of what temptation means biblically. Biblically speaking, it speaks of an enticement to act in disobedient to God's will. So it's, it's not just sexual, it's not just lying, it's not just the, the big ones that pop into our head. The, the things that immediately come into our minds. Temptation um, is our heart being provoked to put, out our, put our will and our desire primary at that moment. It's to put our will and our desires above all else, whether it's a momentary desire or whether it's an extended period of time. In the moment, I could be angry and want to scream at somebody that drives dangerously on the road. In the moment, someone could frustrate me and I could be tempted to respond in a disrespectful and hateful way. That's a temptation. He cannot bless what is not near him. He cannot bless what is separate from him. So there's temptation to settle for in this world. Temptation uh, to settle for what the world deems as love, what the world deems as good, what the world deems as, as proper and kind and these kind of things. We should know that this world's love is conditional, this world's love is circumstantial, and it pursues self-led ambitions and self-led agendas. The world calls it love, but it is a spirit of compromise. The devil looks at the perfect love of God and he absolutely despises it. He wants people to believe that it is not attainable, this love. He wants people to believe that it's, it's better just to have a simplistic version, a simplistic do-what-you-want type of love that is just better. The enemy would have us think. Real love, I would tell you that real love gives, real love serves, and real love does not look for personal gain. Real love does not look for ways to climb the political ladder of the church. Real love is, is honest, has boundaries for the sake of that who they love and the relationships that they call is love. So there, there's temptation in this world to do your own thing and not answer to anyone. 
I, I challenge you to fight against that temptation. I would suggest to you that if you cannot handle or if I cannot handle being accountable to someone, that I am accepting a lesser form of love. The world calls this type of mindset independence. The world calls it strength. The Bible calls it fear. There's temptation to handle your business by yourself. There's temptation to not let anyone in. And there's temptation to do and think what you know best. Because you know best and I know best. And that's the temptation. But we have to be challenged to endure that temptation. I would suggest that if you cannot handle someone getting in your business sometimes, if you cannot handle someone speaking into your life sometimes, then you're accepting a lesser form of love. The, the world calls it a go-getter, a trailblazer. And, and someone without fear is what the world would call it, but the Bible calls it pride. If you cannot be, handle being redirected, and you're, hand, you're accepting a lesser form of love than God intended you to accept. If you do not leave the room, if you don't leave for room for these kind of things in your relationships, you're accepting a lesser form of love. These elements in our relationships, these things that we need to have, accountability and submission and trust and, and honesty and vulnerability, they cannot just come from the preacher. They can't just come from a Sunday or Tuesday or a Wednesday. They have to be in our everyday lives. They have to be in our everyday relationships. To give a few examples, Samson thought he had true love for Delilah. Amnon thought his love for Tamar was pure. Cain thought his love for, for God was true, but he didn't love his own brother. The Pharisees really thought they loved the word of God until God came on the scene and messed up their theology. Many disciples thought they had real love for people until Paul came in to the picture and got in their business. Many disciples thought that they loved truth until someone they didn't like started preaching the truth. So these are things that we have in our mind. We, we think, I, I love that person. I love the word of God. I, I love these things of God. But we have to make sure that we really do sometimes because we are flesh. We are people that struggle. I, I cannot show someone that I love them if I'm too busy for them. I, I can't allow someone to, 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 to know that, they lo that I love them if I'm too busy for them. Someone's going to have a hard time loving you if you're too busy for them. Same thing with the church. So there, there's a fine line, a very fine line between being actively engaged in the work of the church and not being available by way of being actively engaged and involved in the work of the church. There's a very fine line. When you love your family, you're engaged with them. You spend time with them. When you love your spouse, you're engaged with them and you spend time with them. When you, when you love something, you spend time and you're active and you're engaged with that relationship. And there's a temptation to treat someone harshly sometimes. Some, sometimes there's temptation to, to treat kids or treat spouses or treat friends or treat anyone a little harshly because they said something that hurt your feelings. They said something that bothered you a little bit. They, they said something that made you mad a little bit. But we have to endure hard conversations because we love them. We have to endure hearing hard things because we love them. We have to endure trying our patience because we love them. And we have to realize that sometimes after we endure that temptation to not act out inappropriately, that what they're saying may have some truth after all. What, they're, what they have to say about maybe you're struggling with your attitude. Maybe you're struggling with your spirit. Maybe your wife or maybe your husband actually is right about some difficulties that maybe they spot in you that you don't spot in yourself. Our spouses are crucial to us. Our spouses should be our best resource throughout the week. In James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In James 1, 26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, control not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. It's vain. The enemy will always offer you a lesser version of what God has promised you. The enemy will always offer you a lesser version of what God designed and curated specifically for you. 
As, that's, that's why the perfect love of God and accepting the love of God can be so challenging sometimes. It's because we're getting close to the real thing and the enemy says, no, I, I can't let them understand who, they're, who, who God is. I, I can't let them understand how much this God loves them because if they can just grasp how much he loves them, they're going to trust him and they're going to rely on him and they're going to have victory in him and they're not going to sin anymore. They're not going to fall anymore in the same things they used to fall in. So the enemy comes in, he says, I'm going to give you another version that f- makes you feel good. We can look at things in scripture that are very clear. Homosexuality, that, that's something that is still a sin. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what the professor says about it or the politics say about it. It's still sin. No matter how well spoken they are about it, no matter how harmless it might seem, it is still a sin. One man, one woman, period. That is what God has created. That is what God's design is. See, God hates homosexuality, but let's be very clear. He hates homosexuality and sin because he loves you. He hates sin because he loves you. He hates sin because sin separates us from God. And he says, I love them. I don't want them to be far from me. So he, he hates sin because he wants to bless his people. He wants to put honor upon his people. And if we are in sin, we cannot be blessed. We cannot be honored. We cannot be favored among people who are favored because we are separate from the Lord. So this idea of love the world provides. Pornography, it's still a sin. Whatever form that it is in, it is still a sin. Pornography on the internet, pornography on your phone, pornography in a book, pornography in any version that is possible, it's still a sin. I, I, was, in a, I was in a Sunday school class when I was a kid. I don't know what age it was, but my grandma was teaching the class. And uh, she was talking about different things, and she says, all right, everybody, what is pornography? Everybody asked questions, said the definition of it or whatever, and she says, she read the definition. I don't remember exactly. I'm going to paraphrase. But basically, anything that is designed to motivate sexual desire. It doesn't have to be something we watch. It doesn't have to be something we see. It can be conversations that we're a part of. It can be things we allow ourselves to, to hear at work. Things that entice the wrong things is what that is. And it's sin because it pulls us away from God. It pulls us away from what he wants. When, when you love the body, you're engaged with them. When you love the church and the, the things of the church, you are engaged with that. When we love submission and the things of God, we're engaged with the vision. We're engaged of the mission of the church and actively engaged with the pastor, the leadership, and being available for the vision and the mission of the church. We can look again at, at people in the Bible. Mark, James, Paul, Matthew, Luke. They all went to their torturous graves saying the same thing. I saw Jesus is what they said. I, I, I know Jesus. Not only do I know this man, but I know that this man is God Almighty wrapped in flesh. This Jesus corrected me. This Jesus put boundaries on me, rebuked me, and told me I was wrong and needed to change. But that's how I know that he loves me. Their, their love for Jesus, their, their love for the gospel, it pushed them to be unmoving from this truth. Their love for Jesus and their love for the gospel, it did not provoke them to put someone else on the chopping block in the moment when they were going to get whatever they were going to get. They, they didn't look to save themselves in the moment when, when, when they were put to their death. They, they, they don't go to their deathbed saying, well, hey, this, this disciple messed up over here, why don't you go get him? This disciple said this, so why don't you go get him? No, they chose to say, you know what? I love Jesus, I love the gospel, and I'm going to endure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, the Bible says, Charity or love suffereth long. It's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Love never fails. You, you have another story in Acts 7. You have a man named Stephen whose love for people was not shaken by the stones that killed him. But he called out to God in that moment to have his murderer's sins not be called among them. 
In that moment, there was a temptation. In that moment, it would have been very easy for him to succumb to the temptation that says, hate those people. Curse those people. Those people are terrible people. And that's the temptation of the church. Oh, those rotten sinners, those rotten people, they just can't get out of their mess. Those horrible, awful people. But Stephen didn't do that. He says, don't count these sins against them because I love them anyway. I love them even when they're doing bad things to me. I love them when they're beating me. I love them when they're killing me. And my love for them has to be greater than anything I can experience while I am pursuing loving them. Could that really be a reason, maybe an underlying reason that why some of us are some, so lonely sometimes? Could that be an underlying reason why sometimes we have problems connecting to others at times? Maybe, maybe that could be a reason why sometimes we don't feel like we belong in rooms or, or, or services. Could that be because sometimes you or I aren't enduring enough? Could it be because you or I are not showing as much grace as we could for the flaws in people? It's very easy for us to, to, to disagree about things, but we can't let it disunify us. It's very easy to disagree about things in Scripture even, uh, different convictions about things, but we can't let those things separate us from love and separate us from the work of God and separate us from the mission and the vision of God. There are things that provoke us to not get along that should not. Most of the time when we don't get along with people, it's really not that big a deal. We, we cannot let things get in the way of, of us having unity. Maybe, and just maybe that many times the reason and the cause of there being a lack of intimacy among the people of God is because maybe you and I don't endure each other enough. And maybe, maybe they're a 9 and I'm at a 1.3 on the Enneagram. Maybe they're an outreach person and I'm not. Maybe they're a musician and maybe I'm a Sunday school teacher. Maybe they have kids and I don't. Maybe they don't pray like me. Maybe they don't preach like me. Maybe they don't think like I do. So I really can't connect with them very well because they're just not like me. If we're being honest, many of our issues, many of the disunifying factors of the church are preference-based. More than scripture-based. The Bible never encourages us to separate from the body. The Bible does not encourage us to have an issue with one another. The Bible says to come together. The Bible says don't bring your gift to the altar until you're together. So the Bible does not want us to allow little petty things to separate us. The Bible does not encourage us to have cliques. The Bible does not encourage us to let our preferences get in the way of us working in harmony, working in unity together in the body of Christ. We ought to be able to work with anybody in this room and anybody in the body. We ought to be able to pray with and encourage and lift up anyone in the body. There ought not be one person that we can't plead the blood with and pray and speak in tongues with and worship and pray with and outreach together with. There ought not be anybody that we can't sit down and talk about the Bible with. Even if there's something you disagree with in the Bible. We have to be together. The Bible says in Psalms 133, verses 1 through 3, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. In Matthew 5, 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I would encourage you that if you want to battle spiritually, if you want to engage in spiritual warfare, pursue and pray for unity. I guarantee you that will get you in the battle. If you want to be in the battle spiritually and engage with spiritual warfare, pursue and pray 1 Corinthians 13. Pray every verse upon you that you apply every verse of that chapter on you. That will guarantee you the enemy will not be happy and you are engaged with spiritual warfare. The enemy hates when we're together. The enemy hates when we endure each other and when we love each other and when we trust each other. The enemy hates it when you're going through something and you can call a brother and say, hey, can you pray for me? The enemy hates that more than your feelings do. The enemy hates that more than your fears do in your head before you call that person. And you're afraid of judgment and you're afraid that they won't accept you and afraid that they think that you're failing at something. The enemy's failure and the enemy's fear of that is far surpassing your fear of doing it. 
See, we as the church, we don't accept a lesser form of love. We, we, we subscribe to everything in the word of God. We subscribe to everything that he says and everything that he teaches. We pursue the love of Jesus. And so this is how so many strongholds are, are built up in people's lives. It's, it's a misguided concept of love. Because when there's a misguided concept of love, when there's not a full understanding of what love is, there's, there's lesser forms of love accepted. And what that means is there's room for error. There's room for the enemy to get in and build ideas in the mind, build strongholds in the mind, build strongholds in the emotions, build walls up that we can't get past. And removes the possibility for intimacy because there's an acceptance of a lesser version of love. See, that's what we face in this world. It's souls that have accepted a lesser version of love. It's souls that have strongholds upon their mind and strongholds upon their heart because they've settled for a lesser form of love because they've, they're ignorant. They do want peace. They do want joy. They do want love. They want the things of the Lord. They just have to be introduced to it by the church. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds has to do with the mind. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So as a church, we have to endure a bit to win souls. As a church, we have to put up with some stuff to win souls. You're going to have to have forgiveness in your heart each and every day. All day, every day, you will have to have forgiveness in your heart and compassion in your heart and grace in your heart every day. It's, it's never enough to say the right things only. It's never enough to know the right verses and be able to teach the right things. You have to have the love and forgiveness and compassion for your person that you're working with. We have to think the right things. We have to think good thoughts. We have to think the best of our brothers and our sisters. And we have to think the best of the people that we are working with. We have to be optimistic about the, the possibility of them getting closer to God. We have to believe for them and in them because oftentimes they don't believe in themselves. See, there's times that that person that you're working with and that person that has been difficult in the process of discipleship, they're going to call you and they're going to text you. And there's going to be times where it seems like they are calling you and texting you for no reason at all, for meaningless reasons. Why are you calling me about this? Why are you asking me this question? Why are you texting me this thing? There are times when they do that. But maybe we should work on our perspective of that sometimes. Because sometimes when they're calling and texting, that may just be their way of saying, hey, I want to see if they pick up for me. Just to see if we respond to that. They might just be doing that to see if you really love them. They might just be doing that to see if you are reachable, if you're accessible. If their cry, if their need, if their concern, does it reach your ears? Does it reach your heart? Does it provoke something in you to want to do something about it? They, they will sin. They will sin like all sin and all fall short of the glory of God. But the question is, when they do, when, when that person that I'm working with, when they sin, how do I respond? How do I respond when they disappoint me? How do I respond when they don't follow through with what they said they're going to do? How will I respond when they said that they're going to come to church? They're, they're going to come to Bible study. They're going to pray through. They're going to do the things that we've been talking about. How do I respond when they don't follow through on the commitments? The Bible tells us in Galatians 6, 1 through 3, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. And the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Uh, the, a big part of maturing in love is enduring one another. It's enduring the difficulties and the challenges of the flesh that we have. It's enduring and, and, and listening to all the crazy things that the disciples sometimes that we reach out to in this world, they say crazy things. They believe crazy things. They believe nonsense. 
But that's not a reason to disconnect from them. That's not a reason to stop reaching for them. That's, that's not a reason to, to stop pouring into the word of God. If they'll listen, if they will hear, if they have a heart that wants God, we still pour in the love of God to them. We still pour in the word of God to them. Even if it doesn't make sense, and even if it doesn't seem like they're making a lot of progress, if they have a heart that wants God, we still pour into them. We still pour into them. Because just as quickly as, as we notice when somebody is not enduring us, they notice when we are not enduring them. They notice when we are impatient with them. They notice when we are frustrated with them. They notice when we are just have ran out of all patience and we're just like, I'm done. I'm not working with this person anymore. Maturing is in love is understanding that it's a long process to bring someone to a place of maturity in God. It's a long process, and you have to go through a lot of different things. This thing does not happen overnight. It doesn't happen as soon as somebody gets the Holy Ghost. It's not, it doesn't happen as soon as somebody gets baptized in Jesus' name. There's a lot of growth to still happen. There's a lot of process and, and things they have to mature in. There's a lot of mindsets and ideas that they have to, have to get adjusted in their walk with God. Discipleship is something that takes a long time. It takes walking with them in their life, walking with them through different situations, walking with them through every single thing that they face as best as you can. And there are times when we take a step back. There are times where we let them get hurt. There are times where we, we step back and we allow them to make decisions that maybe they shouldn't make. But we're still reachable to them when they have needs. We're still reachable to them when they cry out and when they ask, uh, I, need, I need prayer and I need some help. I want to be mature in love. I want to be mature in my love in the body of Christ. I, I don't want to miss an opportunity to be close to the body because I'm not patient enough with the body. I want to make sure that I'm mature in that. If we could stand... I do not ever want to be in a place where I, I, I accept a lesser form of love than God desired for me to have. Uh, this body here, we all have pieces in us. We have vital pieces in us that are essential for, for the body to work at its full capacity. And if we get to a place where we're not enduring one another sometimes and we're impatient with one another sometimes or, man, I don't like that he said that. I'm annoyed at them now. We got we to get rid of that. We, we have to get rid of that because we need to work together in unity. And we want to make sure that we are working at the full capacity in every area that we can possibly work in. Sometimes there's times where we are frustrated in the ministry that we are frustrated in. But many times that's because we're frustrated with somebody rather than the ministry. And many times that's because we're frustrated with the situation with somebody rather than frustrating because I'm serving. If we are working together, and if we are loving one another and being patient with one another, ministry is easy. Ministry is easy when we work together as a body. If we could pray for just a few moments. Lord, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for all that you do, all that you are, and your love for us. God, your patience towards us. God, I ask that you would help us today, help me today, endure each person, Lord God, in my life. God, I want to be able to be a vessel for you in every area. God, I want to be able to be a benefit, in addition, God, to the relationships in my life. God, I want to have patience for the people around me because I want them to have patience for me. Lord, I pray that my heart would be full of compassion, full of grace and mercy, God. Help me see the needs of others. Help me see the circumstances and the stresses of others around me, God. God, I want to be pleasing in what I do. I want to be pleasing in my relationships to you, Lord God. I pray, God, that you would wash my heart, wash my mind of anything that you would not want in it, Lord. God, I want to be effective and focused in your kingdom, God. I want to see the people that I need to see. I want to see the needs, God, that you want me to see, Lord God. Lord, I praise you. I worship you, God. I magnify you, Jesus. I pray that we would walk together. I pray, God, that we would be unified, God, in mind and heart and spirit. Lord, in perspective, Lord, in attitude, God. We want to be right in your eyes. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We magnify you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.